everyone. So I want to do an intro to talk about this amazing podcast host. This was a recording that I did a number of years ago before I properly launched the podcast. And despite the audio quality on my behalf being a complete amateur at the time, the information in this podcast is far too good not to publish. This is with Sean Croxton. Sean was the person who got me into wanting to be in the health industry. His YouTube channel um, and the Underground Wellness Radio really, really inspired me as a young 21-year-old to go down the rabbit hole of health. He was the guy that took my lectures that overwhelmed me at the time and made them accessible. In some ways, this guy got me through university. He has now gone away from the health market and moved into the mindset and the prosperity market, teaching people to build fantastic businesses, but more importantly than that, rock star massively bulletproof mindsets that can help them in any endeavor in life. In this episode, we talk about the mindset of health, getting in shape, and what people do that self-sabotage their goals. I was extremely honored and starstruck to get Sean on the podcast and it's a shame it's taken this long for me to publish it. I would like to thank Sean for his time and this amazing interview and if you want to go and follow Sean, at the end of the show he will tell you about where to find him. You can find him on Instagram and his quote of the day show which is definitely, definitely worth a listen as well as his old podcast, The Sean Croxton Sessions, definitely worth a listen. Now I'm going to leave you to myself and Sean Croxton. Today I'm very honoured to get my first big name guest. This is probably the most starstruck I've been, and this shows how much of a nerd I am, that I've been following this guy since the university. So nine years I've been following you now. Um, really? Start, yeah, nine years. Started off with um, a YouTube channel of Underground Wellness, which absolutely blew up into over half a million subscribers you got, got before you moved on from that. Am I right in that? Nah, I think there's only like a hundred and something thousand, like a hundred and three thousand people there now. So no, yeah. not half a million. Nah, <laughs> I wish. Yeah, but you say. So I think being humble. But then um, from there, he's advanced his message from functional medicine and now working in particularly on the mind and developing people through their, their business and their confidence. So I'm going to introduce Sean. So tell us who you are and how you feel you can help people with their health. Oh, well, who am I? I'm a guy with a really good meditation buzz right now. You have no idea. Do you meditate? Uh, I should. I don't enough. Oh, man, I got a good one today. Um, <laughs> I'm super blissed out right now. Okay. Uh, who am I? I am, um, gosh, I am possibility. I'm anything I want to be. I am um, a guy put here on the earth to help people, you know, to serve out my purpose and make sure that I impact as many people as I can, uh, showing people how to find their the greatness within. Uh, am, I, am I still, uh, can I help people with their health? Yes. Um, not as directly as I could before, uh, you know, where my, you know, main thing was health and holistic health and functional medicine and all that stuff. But um, I think and we'll probably talk about this later that one of the best ways to improve your health is to work through the mind, because in order to make the changes that need to be made to improve your health, you have to have a, a stronger mindset. You have to know how the mind works, how the brain works and all that stuff. And so, you know, I always tell people that. The clients, when I was doing functional diagnostic nutrition, the clients who got the best results were the ones with the best attitudes, mm -hmm. the ones with the most positive thinking, yeah. the ones who had the most negative thinking, thinking those are the ones who didn't get better. And so it kind of begs the question, you know, what came first? Was it the negative thinking or was it the symptoms or did the negative thinking cause the symptoms or did the symptoms cause the negative thinking? And for me, I think that for most people out there, the overwhelming majority, it starts with negative thinking. And, you know, screwing up the vibration of the body and the, and the cells and uh, throws the body for quite the loop. And, you know, you start to get unhealthy and it's almost like a, a wake up call. It's like a signal, like the symptoms can be like a signal, you know, to you that, yo, you're 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 caught in a very negative state right now. We got to get you out of this. If not, we're going to put you in the dirt. Mm. I think I think that's like resonates with me and with what I work with is is body transformations for the most part and people doing like busy executives doing really fast kind of weight loss and health improvements. And you can see the people that do really, really well are the people that it's almost easy. They'll find solutions for everything. They don't, they're not questioning in a negative way. They want to explore and find out more. And you can see those people always go on to better than people that sort of 
wanting that quick fix or just trying to, you know, nitpick and try and keep their old habits. So I think that resonates a lot with most people. Yeah, with, with the quick fixers, those old habits end up coming right back. Mm. You know, it, you know, I always talk about be, do, have. And, you know, having good health, you have to do certain things. But in order to do the things, you have to be a certain way. You have to be a certain person. You have to become somebody new to do the things that get you healthy. Mm. Now, when you're just focusing on the doing part, on all of the actions, and you haven't truly become the person who takes those actions, you're forcing yourself. You know, as you say, you are white knuckling it through. Yeah. And, you know, what tends to happen is, you know, you might get that result. You might come close to that result. You might even start to get that result. But what happens is you revert back to who you used to be. And three, four months later, you're in a worse state than you were in before and you're looking for similar help. So you keep doing this cycle over and over and over and over again because you really haven't gotten down to truly becoming a different person. In order to make changes, you have to become a different person. And if we don't do that, then we're in a, a lot of trouble because um, everything's just going to be temporary. We're always going to fall back to the behaviors that we, we, we did before. Okay. So, um, is you talking about action being sort of like the you sort out the mind to be able to take action what was the catalyst for you to start taking care of your own health um and really deciding that this is kind of what you wanted to do with your career and help people with this i've always been a fairly healthy individual mm. um my mom kind of instilled that in us. I remember she used, to, she used to take us on jogs and stuff and yeah. my parents always encouraged sports and yeah. we ate fairly well growing up, but I think it, it wasn't until, hmm, you know, and I did the whole bodybuilding thing in college, yeah. but I think it wasn't until, you know, I got out of college and started working as a personal trainer and I had, you know, some depression and anxiety issues of my own and I found that, you know, what I learned in college about nutrition really wasn't as effective as it I was told it would be. Mm. And, you know, that's why I, when I started exploring, you know, things like uh, people like Weston A. Price and Paul yeah. Check and William Walcott and Lauren Cordain and just looking at like, OK, how are we supposed to eat? Like, how have we been eating or had we been eating for maybe millions of years? And like, what has changed? And mm. what I found out was that, gosh, most of what I learned in college about what we should eat were relatively new foods. Mm. And I learned that they actually weren't very healthy, but I've been recommending them and consuming them myself. And so, you know, I made the leap and started, you know, changing to a very just eat real food, paleo, primal, ancestral way of eating. I started to feel better. My clients started to look and feel better. And so that really sold me. So that's what kind of um, inspired me to truly take action. It was just more like, to me, it was more like common sense, you know, as mm. I said. We ate a certain way for a long time and we're relatively healthy. Then we changed it and got unhealthy. Well, okay, let's do what we were doing before we made the changes. You know, so to me, it was like common sense and it, it just it works. So, so back then at the time when you were, you were PT and your results weren't as good as you wanted to be with your clients, what do you think was like sort of the, either the root cause or sort of the biggest issues facing the health world or the obesity problem that we have in the 21st century that made you go, okay, I'm going to start this YouTube thing. I'm going to try and spread this message out to as more, you know, as many people as possible. Uh, what was the first part of that question? What was the what? So when you looked at the, you know, your clients not getting the results that right. you were wanting right. and then you start to do that YouTube thing, what was the sort of the biggest issue you found in like okay. 20th century health? Uh, you know, the, the biggest is issue of course was obesity and it was obesity due to misinformation. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I remember being a kid and uh, we went through the whole fat free phase and everybody's like, oh, you can eat these donuts or these uh, danishes or whatever because they're fat free. And you're not going to get fat. But at the same time, they were full of sugar. So for a lot of us, it was just misinformation. It was the government telling us that we should eat this way. And that really wasn't the way that we should have been eating. Like they were pretty wrong about that. And so, yeah. you know, as most people would do, they're going to follow what the government says, because if the government's saying it, then it must be backed by somebody. So that was a huge um, mm. precipitator, we'll say, of obesity. Yep. And, you know, always there's convenience. Um, you know, people are, gosh, they are, they, they're, they're stuck in such a convenient way of eating. You know, everything's got to be quick, which is cool. And I even do that myself now, mm -hmm. but I do it in a, in a fairly healthy way. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, and and I, get, I think the other thing would be kind of the emotional addiction side of things, yeah. almost medicating ourselves with food. I mean, people are just so unhappy. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the things that we need 
in order to live mm, a happy, healthy life is to have some type of purpose in our lives. And I think that 95% of the population is out there walking around without a purpose. I think they don't feel really good about themselves. And I think a really quick, easy, certain way to change that state to make ourselves feel better is to eat, you know, highly fatty, highly sugared, sweet, delicious foods. And so we're just stuck in this cycle of just feeling bad and then medicating ourselves. And in the end, what you get is obesity and a lot of the other issues that we have these days. So do you think the convenience of those foods is, is also exacerbating this problem of emotional eating because people don't have that get up and go to sort of help themselves almost? I think some people do have to get up and go to help themselves. Actually, I think everybody has to get up and go to help themselves. They just don't do it. Mm. Um, but I think that, again, is one of the main reasons why we turn to some of these foods. You know, we're so busy all the time. Yeah. You know, our schedules are screwed up. I mean, when I used to be a functional diagnostic nutritionist, one of the first things I would do was look at my client's schedule. Yeah. Like, hey, what have you got going on? Like, what is your schedule like? And they weren't even really making time to eat. And when you don't make time to eat, you're just going to eat on the run. You're going to eat the most convenient thing that you can find. And typically, for most people, that's not an apple. You know, it's not a pear. It's not a, a smoothie of some sort with some green vegetables and stuff in there. It's typically something processed and terrible for you. And so, yeah. you know, I think we all just need to slow down. And I think we just really need to figure out or discover, like, why we're here and to take action on it and start yeah. living by our highest values. Mm -hmm. You know, most of us kind of live by societal expectations, what our mothers and our fathers want us to do, what society expects us to do. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just not the way to live. It's almost like you're living somebody's life. And mm -hmm. when you're living somebody's life um, on the freeway, going to a job that you hate every day, yeah. I think the only option that a lot of people have to feel better is these convenient foods that they eat every day. And so, you know, it's a multifactorial problem that that I wish uh, that's hard to address, to be honest, because mm. there's so many factors there. And also because, you know, when somebody's looking to lose weight or to get healthy, they don't feel like they need a therapist. Mm. You know, they don't feel like they need somebody to help them find their purpose or to work through, work through some negative emotions that they've been dealing with and cycling over and over and over again. Mm. Um, they're looking for a meal plan. But, you know, in general, the meal plans that they're given um, take too much time for them to prepare. You mm. know, we're going to health coaches these days and the health coach is like, here's your list of foods that you have to spend time going to the store to buy, even though the only real store you go to now is a 7-Eleven or through a, a drive through window. And mm. here's all the recipes that you need to cook with this time that you don't have. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And so we're not I don't think. Where uh, people are being helped the right yeah. way, you know what I'm saying? We need to make it. If they, if they are causing the problem with convenience, I feel like we almost need to solve the problem with convenience and make it easier for people to take these steps to get healthier. But yeah. if you're trying to flip somebody's life upside down, completely change their schedule, add all this stuff into an already busy schedule, um, I, I can only imagine how overwhelming that feels to them. Yeah. And in the end, it's not going to work, mm. period. So in, in, with that in mind then, so you're looking at someone who's got this, you know, big, big goal that they want to achieve. They want to achieve these results now. Where's your biggest bang for your buck start of making a, like a change that they can stick to? I think the first one is to just eat real food. You know, because they, and I could go into all the mind stuff, yeah. but again, that's not what they're looking for. Yeah. Let's work on just eating real food. Okay, cool. You eat three, four, five really terrible meals. Let's start with breakfast. You know, let's actually make a healthy breakfast. And that doesn't have to be eggs and bacon and all of these things, right? It can just be a shake with a yeah. really high quality protein powder, throw some spinach, some greens, mm. maybe some greens powder, something like that, something just good for you, and drink it in the car on the way to work. Mm. Drink it in the, on the bus, drink it on the, the rail, wherever, wh whatever you do. But it's much better to make that small change and keep it consistent over a 21 to 28 day period so it can become a habit, even though research says that it can take 66 days for something to become a habit these days. Um, maybe it was always that way. We just didn't know. But let's do that. Let's make that little small step in order to get to where that person wants to go. Because here's the thing. Your brain, when you have a goal and it's looking at a big picture goal, 
uh, I forget the part of your brain it is, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. It is a ventral medial mm-hmm. prefrontal, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. It likes to look at the big picture, but when you're staring at the big picture all the time, it can feel overwhelming. So when you give somebody all of these things that they need to do, they're like, oh my God, you completely turned my life, again, upside down, I'm completely overwhelmed. What the brain likes is baby steps. It is so mm-hmm. critical just to give somebody baby steps. So if that baby step is just focus on breakfast, they'll do a much better job because that's going to activate a different part of the brain called the caudate caudate nucleus, which is part of the basal ganglia that is responsible for looking at um, smaller things, smaller steps. So let's start with one and let's move on to the other. And I think that's more realistic and useful for most people than completely changing their lives. I think think that goes into like the the concept of momentum as well, which I think is so underestimated in terms of getting started with everything. I think starting something early in the day, like an easy breakfast, if you start the day well, you tend to make better options going forward from that. Whereas if you start badly, you end up with that, I'll start again on Monday. And I remember that's one, yeah. it's one of the biggest things I took from your book. And I remember when I worked at Virgin Active, people like wondering what all these colors that were coming out of my, uh, my blender were. And it was all the uh, shake recipes from your recipe guy for Dark Side of Fat Loss. Oh, um, nice. Very yeah. cool. So, yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, how powerful do you think momentum is in this? And how do you get somebody to start building momentum? Uh, how do you get somebody to start building momentum? Oh, well, number one is to start. Mm. And when you were saying that, because I have this thing about moments, you know, a lot of times we just think about the thing that we want to do and we don't take action. And the action doesn't really start until you actually have that that moment mm. where you say, OK, I'm going to sit down and write the book or OK, I'm going to get on the treadmill. I'm going to walk or OK, I'm going to go to the to the supermarket and, and buy the food that I need. That, yeah. That's the moment where it begins. But if you mm. don't have that moment, it never begins. So, you know, moments create momentum, mm. you know, to have that moment and go, OK, I've started now. OK, I feel good. I took an action that makes me feel really good. And I think that feeling good, that that elevated vibration that someone's going to have, because the way that you feel is just um, conscious awareness of the way that your body's vibrating. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so when you can elevate that bright vibration by feeling better, you kind of go, well, damn, I like this. I like mm. how this feels. Let's do this again. And so that's how you can get that momentum. And so, you know, again, the best way is just to to start. Yeah. To get started, to stop thinking about it all the time. Stop thinking about the how so much and just focus on the now. Mm. Like, what can I do right now? And all the other stuff, like all the pieces are going to fall into place, but I can't worry about the other stuff because that's down the line. All I can really focus on is what I'm doing right now in the present. And when you live that way, I think um, there's there's no other thing you can do but crush it step mm. by step. So when we, I want to go into how you like will approach some of the solutions for this kind of thing and how you build this with a client. But just going into sort of how, how you start and how you build up your momentum. So you, um, if I remember correctly, did you sell your first flat screen TV to do one of your first functional medicine courses? Yeah, functional diagnostic nutrition. Yeah, uh, one of my one of my old personal training clients. She recommended it to me. Uh, my main man Reed Davis, and uh, I, it was eight hundred something dollars. I didn't quite have the money for it, but I just moved into an apartment and I got all new furniture, including the flat screen TV, which I never had. This is back in two thousand eight. Yeah. And um, yeah, in order to take that course, I, I took it back to Best Buy and got my money back, and I enrolled in the course. And um, you know, the rest is history. So looking at that now, that got you into functional medicine so for people that don't know what is functional medicine and how do you utilize the changing so what did you take away from that sort of path that you went down uh you know what i took away from it is that um was kind of something i already knew was that we were treating symptoms with the western model of medicine Mm -hmm. and we weren't truly getting to that root cause Mm -hmm. and the root cause of health conditions, you know, in addition to the mind stuff that we talked about earlier, is a breakdown or dysfunction of systems within the body, whether it be the hormonal system, digestive system, immune system, um, the, what else, digestion or detoxification, whichever one I didn't say. Um, there's a breakdown there. And so, you know, with functional medicine, we find where the dysfunction is and we use the proper protocols in order to build it back up. And so we can restore health that way. And so, um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a really cool way of, of looking at health because it's not covering up symptoms, 
with medications. Like typically yeah. the medications don't cure something. The medications just say, okay, you're just not going to feel it anymore. Mm. You know what I'm saying? It's going to be okay. You're just not going to feel it. Just keep moving on with life. And, but still the body is like breaking down and breaking down and breaking down, which leads to other problems down the road, including, you know, medication addiction and side effects and things and taking medications for medications. And it gets kind of ridiculous. And so I'm really glad that I got that education because it allowed me to see um, health and nutrition and the body in a completely different way. Mm. I think that's something that's really, really big here in the UK as well with um, the NHS. They do a great job. I'm not going to say anything against the NHS, but a lot of I think it's just lack of funding and lack of knowledge. I've seen so much, particularly in anxiety and depression, the so high dosage of things like diazepam and floxetines and things like this, just because they've never really known what the root cause is. So they just throw these drugs at it. Yeah, but it's, it's interesting. You know, there's two sides to every story. And I, I refuse to say, and this is completely different than when I started underground wellness back yeah. in 2006, 2007, but I refuse to believe that doctors are stupid. You know, you, you can't get through medical school and, and be dumb and, you know, just do silly stuff all the time. You know, working with clients as a functional diagnostic nutritionist, it can be quite challenging to to get somebody to make the behavior changes. Yeah. You know what I mean? If a doctor, you got to, you know, imagine this scenario, you know, somebody goes into the doctor's office and they've got anxiety or depression and the doctor says, okay, here's what I need you to do. I need you to exercise, you know, 20 to 30 minutes a day. I need you to choose new friends because your current friends are completely negative. I need you to turn off the news. I need you to have positive thoughts. I need you to um, eat real food, preferably organic. I need you to go to bed at, you know, nine to 10 o'clock and get eight hours of sleep a day. I need you to maybe do some yoga or some meditation and da 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 It just gives them the list of things to do. How many people are actually going to do that? Mm. They're not. There, there's, yeah. there aren't that many people who are actually going to do that. And so the other side of that is like, OK, since 95 percent of people aren't going to be willing to do this, here's your medication because it's going to make you feel better. Yeah. And so I can't I can't hate on doctors because, you know, there was times where I had clients who just would not make the changes. And I'm just wishing like, yo, I wish there was some natural supplement that completely yeah. can completely fix them and make them feel better. But there isn't the next best option is to go to a doctor and to get a pill. And so it's, um, it's kind of a shitty way to do things, but at the same time, it's at the same time, it's probably the best option because people yeah. don't like to change. Yeah. You know, it's literally, it's not even the people I should say the brain doesn't like the change. The brain doesn't like anything that is unfamiliar. And so when you tell the brain, Hey, here's 12 different things that I need you to do. I need you to become another person in order to fix yourself. The brain goes, no, nah, I'm cool. This is way too different, you know? And so it, it, it sucks how the medical model is, but at the same time, I understand. Mm. So with, with that, I mean, this is probably a really, really broad question. You say the brain doesn't like to change. What are your sort of thoughts into why that is and why is the brain is it particularly reckon it's, feel it's protective or do you feel it's you know why is it the brain kind of resists us trying to do things that are potentially could help our health yeah your brain is protective your brain is a is a survival mechanism it does not like the unknown it is a fearful mechanism and just a single whiff of fear will send your brain into survival mode. Mm. That is just the way it works. Your brain is just like a collection of memories and experiences and feelings from the past. And, you know, when, when a new experience occurs, the brain says, okay, how does this look like something that we've encountered in the past? Okay, we've got it. All right. Um, you know, and it says, hey, if this situation is too different or the change that we need to make is too different from what we've, you know, been programmed to experience in the past, the brain says, no, we don't want to go there because we don't, we're not sure what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. The brain does not like uncertainty by any means. And so, you know, that's where we have to get into, you know, reprogramming the brain by making a concerted effort to go, okay, this thought that I'm having, that I'm not enough or that I can't do it or that I'm not deserving, that's not really me. You know, that's not the spiritual nature of myself. That is my brain trying to trick me into not taking action and not, not moving forward. You know, every time I launch a product or every time I, I turn on the microphone to cr create the intros and outros for my podcast, my brain talks to me. Like, ah, oh, they're going to hate what you're going to say. Da -da 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 -da. But I'm like, oh, that's just my brain. It's not the truth. Let's keep rolling along. And so I think that having an awareness of 
the difference between you and your brain, I think is is critical for a lot of people. And and one thing I think a lot of more people need to know, and I typically talk about this whenever I do, I'm on somebody else's podcast is, you know, what's called your right prefrontal cortex and your left prefrontal cortex. And this is the area of your brain right behind your forehead. Mm. Now, whenever you're making a change and doing something new, your brain and your ego says, oh my God, you're killing me. Like this is death of the existence of your ego. You're trying to do something new. I'm going to die, right? That's what the ego says. Now, when you're going to make a change, your right prefrontal cortex is like where your negative thinking comes from. Your left prefrontal cortex is your commitment center. It commits to new actions. It commits to becoming a better version of yourself. But in order for to get full activation of that left-sided commitment center, you have to go through the bullshit of the right side of the brain. You have to go through that negative self-talk. You have to go through all of the, that defeatist thinking. You have to go through all this thinking thinking and all of the stuff that your brain tells you about how you can't do it. You have to go through that and have an awareness of what it is that it's not you in order to get full activation of the commitment center. But typically what happens is we start to hear that voice in our head and we go, you know what? This isn't for me. But that's part of the process. Anybody who's ever accomplished anything of any significance has gone through that. You are not unique. You are not special. I mean, you are special, but you are not special in the fact that you're going to experience that any time that you try to make a change. Everybody goes through it, and it's actually a good sign. It's your brain saying, we don't want to change. And it's your opportunity to say, no, 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 brain, I, we got to do this. Let's make this happen. And you just keep moving forward. And next thing you know, you've created the change that you want to in your life because you're willing to push through it. Mm. This is definitely why you are a very good guest to like, get on as the first big guest. This, the podcast idea I've had for exact reasons has probably been six to 12 months in the pipeline of me trying to start then listening to those talks and then not starting and then trying to start and then not starting. And it just got to that point where, do you know what, I'm going to have some accountability. Um, I'm in a good place to get this started. I'm just going to start asking people that I want to speak to that I think are really cool that I want to connect to an, an, an audience. And that's when I threw that um, concept form to your website and expecting nothing from it. But just that act of just going for it just allows me to just say, okay, right, it makes me accountable to just build momentum and just start getting, start moving forward. Yeah. And what's the best that can happen? Yeah. It's like it turns into something awesome, right? You see the question that I asked, most people would think I would ask, what's the worst that can happen? Yeah. Oh, the worst that can happen is you can say no and da, 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 da. And that's, that's fine. But what's the best that can happen? Oh, Sean will say yes. You know, yeah. he'll be on the show. We'll have a good conversation. I'll get to put it out to people and help people. Like, mm. we need to, to to change the 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 questions that we ask. Like, what does Tony Robbins say? The quality of your life is um, proportionate to the quality of the questions you ask. Mm. And so, you just got to ask yourself the right question. And when you use that question to focus on the positive to swing the spotlight of your mind out of the self-sabotage and out of the negativity and move it over to the positive, then that gets your brain in an action-oriented state. And that's where you start to move forward. And so you made that switch and now you're starting to move forward. Whereas most of us are gonna focus on like the fear and all of the bad things and the people who are gonna hate us and the people who are gonna criticize us and the loss of love that we're gonna have and the fear of all these things. Like Napoleon Hill has these seven basic fears. And I can't remember them all off the, the top of my head, but it's like fear of death, uh, fear of criticism, fear of loss of love, fear of old age, fear of and a few other ones that don't come to mind. And just about every single thing in our lives that we get in our own way of doing go back to one of those seven fears, fear of failure, fear of success. And so it's a an awareness again of knowing like, okay, this is what I'm dealing with, dealing with. It's a fear. This is a brain-based fear that honestly is not true. You know? Yeah. And in some cases it is true. You know, yes, you're going to create this podcast and people are going to criticize you. Mm -hmm. Like people, you can, you can make the greatest podcast in the world. I have a podcast called the quote of the day show, mm -hmm. which is nothing but positivity. And every once in a while, somebody will send me a mean email about mm -hmm. the show. And I'll be like, seriously, that's just the way that the world works. Yeah. So you're going to get criticized, but it just depends on, okay, what is the significance and impact of your mission? Mm -hmm. You know, who are you going to help? Why are you doing it? And when those things can become bigger than the fear, when they become more significant, 
then the fear, <laughs> you're running. You're running. But if they're not more significant than the fear, and if your eyes are only on the fear, then it's simply not going to work. Mm -hmm. And another thing that we do <clears throat> is we have what are called unconscious conflicts. And so, for example, you know, I teach a course called Money Mind Academy. And, you know, throughout our lives, especially early in life, when we're, when we're the most uh, suggestible, we, um, you know, our parents and the authorities in our lives, they say, you know, money is evil. People who have money are greedy. Um, a rich man can't go to heaven on and on and on. Money doesn't grow on trees. And so we not only store these memories and the feelings associated with them in our brains, but they get locked, they get locked in there. And for a lot of us, they're completely unconscious. And so the brain, it creates this, and it's, it's called the amygdala, it's kind of like your fear center, it's really your emotional center, but we'll just call it the fear center. Mm. This fear center in your brain says, hey, let's create an association with money, that money means evil, money means greed, money means bad, money means this, that, the other. Okay, so it can hold on to these unconsciously. Then you create a conscious goal that says, hey, I wanna make more money. I want to make $100,000 this year or a million dollars this year. So you consciously make it, but you also have an unconscious conflict. You have an unconscious association that says money's bad. And if you make money, your parents aren't going to love you anymore because they think money is bad too. Mm. People, people think that money's greedy. And so you're going to get criticized by everyone and you're going to lose your friends and you're going to lose your family. That's happening unconsciously. And so whenever you have that conflict, the body stops taking action. And then you find yourself back in a sabotage mode. So we can apply this to, we'll say, weight loss. Maybe when somebody was younger and they were more fit and they were more attractive, maybe she's a woman and guys would hit on her all the time and then she would get into relationships and the relationships led to abuse. And so she's associated her leanness, her body weight, her attractiveness to abuse. Now, if this woman sets an um, intention of losing weight, she's got a conflict I want to lose weight, but men are going to abuse me. And in the end, she's going to sabotage herself because the brain is running a conflict. And she's going to go, oh, it was my personal trainer. He sucked. Or, oh, I couldn't do the nutrition program. And she'll probably have some other excuse for why she couldn't do it. But usually it goes back to the conflict and the fear associated with a lean appearance. Mm. So if you're saying this is an unconscious habit that people do, how do you recommend people identify what these habits are, these self-sabotaging behaviors, because if they can't identify, I'm sure there's no way they can work past them. Yeah, you, you, you can. You just have to examine. So, for example, with my money miners, one of the first things that we do is we look at um, their experiences around money, especially in early life. So what was their father's opinions on money? What was their mother's opinions on money? What about the church that they went to? What about the TV shows that they watched? You know, or, you know, you take something like, Titanic and all of the poor people are, you know, under deck or below deck, like partying and having fun and dancing and stuff like that. And above deck, all of the rich people like have all this drama and they're really snooty. And we constantly have this reinforcement of ideas that we learned that we were younger. And every time they get reinforced, the brain, it keeps on like it almost hardwires the, this neural circuitry in. And so it literally just becomes part of us. And so when you go back and you look at some of these early experiences and you understand that those experiences are creating these memories and associations, you go, okay, this is where my unconscious programming is coming from. And this is why I have it. So you can actually identify. Can you identify all of it? Probably not, but you can become more aware mm. of it. And when you have that awareness of it, you go, okay, it's not true. You know, it's meaning that I made up. It's meaning that I, you know, through mirror neurons um, picked up from my my parents. You know what mirror neurons are? Uh, no. Oh, mirror neurons are super cool. Basically, my brain and your brain right now are probably linked up a little bit. Mm. So, for example, like if I yawned, you're probably yeah. going to yawn. Right. Okay. Um, if I'm in a bad mood, you probably feel that I'm in a bad mood. Mm. If you were like super nervous, like sometimes I'll do somebody's podcast and they're super nervous. Yeah. I can feel even though they're, they're hiding it, I can feel the nerves. You know, that's mirror neurons. And so when we're kids and our parents, you know, say certain things, we might not understand what those certain things mean. But since we're there in their presence, we actually pick up their emotions through mirror neurons. And that's what becomes associated with, you know, the the, 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 the experience that we're having. So it's really mm. interesting how that works. Yeah, it's like a spider sense. Like a what? Like a spider sense. 
Yeah, like, yeah, it's like it's spiders in chat. Yeah, exactly. We we totally. I mean, you've walked into a room before and been like, yeah. "Ooh, yeah, there's yeah. something not right going on in here." That's mirror neurons. You're just picking that up. Yeah, I I, I found that like I you know from like past experience of when I've been through whenever I've had things like a string of bad luck, which is probably created by my own actions and the way I've been energy I've been putting out there. But I've noticed that the energy of things around me always a little bit harsher and what I get back in return is never quite as good and then all of a sudden I break pattern and I change the way I think about how I go about my day and all of a sudden everything else starts to spiral and spitball and I think a lot of times going back to what I said earlier on about putting off this podcast having this sort of like me last year was struggling with a number of things of you know appreciation issues and just confidence issues and all of a sudden a couple of things changed and all of a sudden that gave me that new sort of like think thought process of everything and everything started picking up again i started doing all the yeah. things that i've been putting off and it you started go ahead Sam. go ahead yeah it just made me realize that it wasn't everything i was blaming it was always my actions and my ownership that was the issue in the first place yeah and something probably happened that made you start to feel better mm. and it's a trip how the brain works like it's actually i'm studying this a lot lately and getting mm. ready for another course but mm. um your brain has thoughts and every time you have a thought like chemicals get sent out, mm. you know? So there's neurotransmitters that connect with each other in your brain mm. um, that connect neurons to neurons. But when you have a thought, a neuropeptide gets produced by your hypothalamus and mm. can also get pr produced by your immune system. But your hypothalamus gets spit out by the pituitary and the pituitary is gonna send that neuropeptide to one of your glands and the gland makes a hormone and then that hormone gets sent to a cell and that cell could have a specific receptor or has a specific receptor for that hormone. So the hormone interacts with the cell. It makes you feel a certain way. So your thoughts generate chemicals that go down to your cells that make you have certain feelings and have certain emotions, right? Mm -hmm. Now, here's the thing. Your brain, it monitors how you're feeling. So if you're starting to have angry thoughts about something or low confidence thoughts, you're going to feel like you have low confidence hmm. and the brain goes, Hey body, what are you, what, what's, how are you feeling right now? And the body says, we're feeling low on confidence. The brain says, all right, we're going to make some more low confidence thoughts for you then. And it hmm. turns into this cycle where your thinking creates your feelings, but then your feelings create your thoughts in hmm. just the same way that um, people can become addicted to maybe opiates because they're continuing to 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 use the, the 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 drug or something that keeps on binding to that cell. We can become addicted to the way that we feel, mm -hmm. and when we become addicted to the way that we feel, we are constantly generating thoughts, and we find like I can't snap out of I can't snap out of this. I always feel angry. I always feel a lack of confidence. I always feel sad. I always feel depressed. And that's why it's because it's a loop between your brain and your body. Mm -hmm. Your body has started to become your brain. Um, Dr. Joe Dispenza has some really good books about him. Uh, the one that I love the most is um, Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself. Mm -hmm. And so what we have to do is generate or create a conscious awareness that we need to start thinking greater than our feelings. Mm -hmm. We need to understand that, hey, here's what's going on. My thoughts and my feelings are working together. I consciously have to say, okay, yes, I'm angry, but I can break this cycle. Mm. I can, I have the, the, the ability, the God given ability to shift my attention to more positive things. And as I continue to do that with repetition after repetition, after repetition, it's just like weight training mm. with repetition after repetition, I can break this cycle and create a new cycle of feeling good. Mm. Yeah. Does, do you feel it works both ways? Obviously, we have a lot of people saying about the research of almost like your gut being your second brain and how that affects um, sort of neurotransmitter production, the production of serotonin and GABA and things like this. Do you feel like from your functional medicine background, do you feel that that diet plays a role in the opposite way around as well of how you feel? I think diet certainly plays a role in how you feel. Um, you know, if you're having blood sugar swings all the time and you're just feeling bad all the time, that's definitely sending a message to your brain to continue having negative thoughts. Mm. Um, in terms of, you know, it's been so long since I studied um, the second brain. I, I honestly don't have a really good answer for your question, but there's certainly, yeah. it's certainly possible for sure. Yeah, um, I, def I definitely agree with blood sugar swings and affecting things. The, the, the word hangry is now officially in the English dictionary. Have you heard of the word yeah. hang hangry? 
Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, you're hungry and you're angry. I get like that sometimes. I I'll admit if it's been a long time between meals, but you know, if you're if you're having too long between meals or you're having blood sugar swings and you're not feeling good, your brain is probably going to generate more negative thoughts. Yeah. And the thing is like in the what we do in order to start feeling good again is we eat bad food mm. because we know that eating more sugar and more fat is instantaneously going to make us start feeling better. So as I was saying before with people who are obese, who are, you know, possibly, and this can apply to everybody, it doesn't matter your weight, but possibly not living their purpose, hating their lives, feeling like they're living somebody else's life, living by societal expectations. They're feeling bad all the time, generating negative thoughts. And when those negative thoughts in that loop is happening, one of the easiest ways to feel good if you're not using drugs is to eat bad foods. Yeah. It's just kind of the way it works. Yeah. I am um, on, on the top of the word hangry. I wish I'd never, ever taught my girlfriend that word. She never got angry when she was hungry until I explained what that word was. And now she gets really angry all the time. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> now you can explain like your feelings are generating your thoughts and your thoughts are generating your feelings. You got this cycle yeah. going on. It's gotta, you got to break the you got to break the cycle, girlfriend, and think greater than your feelings. Yeah. 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 yeah there you go. A little motivational speech. And all of a sudden, I won't get in the butt. But, um, so yeah, so look, so with that as well, you're talking about um, the the influence of f living somebody else's life, and so how do you feel that environment that plays the impact on this? Obviously, Simon Sinek um, always talks a lot about the the reasons why how social media is affecting people today more in a way to change their subconscious thoughts and their beliefs. How do you feel the environment impacts this, and how can we go about helping and not change that, but just sort of dealing with that environment better? Well, I, I want to make sure I fully understand this question because I haven't looked up uh, Simon Sinek stuff, but yeah. um, your environment, of course, is going to be very um, important when it comes to the way that you think. But here's the thing. You know, I always tell people you have to believe in nonsense. So our environment is what we perceive, you know, with our eyes and our ears and our ability to taste, touch, and what's the other one? Smell. No. But I believe that we need to, as Dr. Dr. Joe Dispenza says, um, think greater than our environment. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we allow our environment to dictate the way that we feel. We have a particular set of circumstances in our lives, and we use those to we 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 use those circumstances to confirm our thoughts. Mm -hmm. So there's there's reality that's coming in, but then we filter it with our thoughts and our opinions, and our positions, yeah. our points of view, and all of that stuff. And so the reality that we have isn't the reality that everybody sees. It's receives. It's just um, it's the way that we filter it. And so I feel that by changing our beliefs and our opinions and our points of view and our positions, we can actually change our reality. And so when I say believe in nonsense, it means, you know, for me, you know, I live in this beautiful house, we'll say. And, you know, there's certain circumstances in my life that I love and there's some that I, I want to change. Um, but at the same time, I create a brand new reality in my mind. Mm. I create a brand new, uh, like fourth dimensional thing in my mind by using my imagination mm. and by using my imagination and holding it there, holding the image of how my life is going to be. And actually not even how it's going to be, but how it already is in my mind and feeling as if it has already been accomplished and feeling grateful for the fact that it, it is happening and mm -hmm. will happen one day is the best way to change your environmental circumstances, mm -hmm. you know, because you're literally giving the brain, um, you're, you're punching a destination into your brain. Mm -hmm. And when you punch the destination or the intention into your brain and you hold it there with a strong burning desire, then the brain has no other thing to do but create plans to take you there. Mm -hmm. You know, this is why, you know, self-help people are always talking about create a, vid a vision, you know, um, uh, feel yourself in the feeling or create the feeling of the wish fulfilled. Mm -hmm. um, have gratitude before it happens, because all of this happens within the all of this works in the brain to create um, what are called it's called preemptive perception, I think, or non effortful actions. So basically it creates a motor map in your brain on an unconscious level and your brain says, okay, since you know, you know exactly where you want to go. I'm going to intuitively whisper all of the steps to you. Mm. You know, it's so funny, like when people have imposter syndrome, mm. you know, so people feel like, oh, my God, I've become so successful, but I don't know how I got here. And mm. I feel like someone's going to find me out. Mm. You know, the reason why they feel that way is because the way that they got there was completely unconscious. 
for a lot of people. It was them setting an intention in their brain to live greater than their circumstances. They created the vision and then the brain just kind of intuitively showed them the steps. It just yeah. showed them the way. And so, but but since it unconsciously happened, then they don't know exactly how it happened. And they can't describe it. They can give you the big chunks. They yeah. can give you the big milestones, but all those little things in between, they don't know what happened. And so to, to get further into your question, I honestly, I don't think social media is that big a deal. I think we make way too much out of social media. You know, um, I think Gary Vaynerchuk might, might have talked about this one day. You know, back in the day, I forget, it was the Ed Sullivan Show or something. They thought that because the Ed Sullivan Show showed Elvis shaking his hips, like you can see Elvis from like the waist down, like the whole world was going to go to hell. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And obviously, like, we're okay. We're going to be fine. Even the bad things that happen, they aren't because Elvis sh sh shook his hips. It's like, again, human beings do not like change. Mm. And so whenever things change, we go, oh, this social media stuff, no, no, no. This is this is different. This is bad. Woo, 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 woo. But honestly, I feel more connected to people now than I did before social media. Mm. You know, we hear yeah. all of this stuff about, oh, social media, you're not connected to people anymore. Are you fucking kidding me? Pardon my French. Like, seriously, I am overly connected to people now. Like, people can find me wherever. They can send me messages whenever. Yeah. Like, I feel there's relationships that I wouldn't have been able to keep before. I can keep now because of social media. I can stay updated on what friends are doing and all that stuff in a convenient way. Um, I think that the connection that I have with certain people is a connection that I choose to have, mm. you know, that next level connection. But, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with social media by any means. Like, I honestly don't think social media is pretty cool. Mm. Is it something I spend my entire day doing? No. And I think that's the issue. Mm. People spend their entire day on social media. And just real quick, in order to be successful in life, you have to be willing to sacrifice something. You have to be willing to give up something of a lower nature in order to have something of a higher nature. And one of the reasons why we're unable to reach this higher nature is because we're too busy on social media. So I don't think social media itself is a bad thing. It's the way that people use social media that's the problem. Because when I post a picture on social media, no matter what time of day it is, the same people keep on liking it. And it's like, what are you guys doing? It's 11 a.m. on a work day. Are you not at work? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, what are you doing? And, and and oddly, like, social media is slower on weekends than it is during the weekdays. Mm. So the days that we have off, people aren't really on social media as much. But when we're working, people are on social media all day. And then we complain about how we're not, like, getting ahead in life. Yeah. We can get ahead in life if you, if you actually, like, turn off your Instagram every once in a while. But anyway, that's a rant. Yeah. Does, it, does, it, does it show <laughs> does it show something that's uh, it's quite unfortunate that but people aren't on social media because they're at the weekends and they're really enjoying themselves and they're not fulfilled doing what they're doing for the majority of the week, which is a shame, yeah, right? Exactly. And it's almost like we get a high out of social media. Yeah. You know, we get a high out of liking things. We get a high out of the distraction. And, um, you know, and I'm sure there's a lot of molecular and physiological stuff going on there and people are becoming addicted to social media. We're becoming addicted to likes. We're becoming addicted to feeling insignificant all of the time mm. and finding significance through social media. And so again, like I said, social media itself is not the problem when used properly. Yeah. It's how human beings use it that's the issue. Yeah, it's, it's, it goes back to this thing of taking ownership, right? So if, if people are taking ownership of their own actions and what they want to do and what they want to achieve, then social media, people blaming social media is more trying to put a mask on a blame on something else because they're trying to hide from something in their own lives by distracting themselves to social media. rather. Than right. It, yeah. If you have a purpose in life, you're not on social media all yeah. day. I'm sorry. You're mm. just you're just killing time on mm. social media and looking for significance and just looking to distract yourself from mm. the um, I hate to say misery, misery of your your life. But. You know, I can't think of a better word for it. It's just, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's really too bad. And, um, yeah, I just wish more people can actually have the courage to step out and like really do a thing that they want to do in life. And to be honest, the thing that they were put here for is usually right in front of their noses. 
and they mm. usually know exactly what it is. It's that thing that comes really easy to them. Mm. You know, it's that, you know, whether it be, I don't know, playing a guitar or giving somebody advice about relationships or changing oil or, you know, doing nails or cutting mm. grass or whatever it may be. Um, it's right there in front of you. Mm. And the thing is, is like we either think it's too insignificant, you know, and I think all those things I just mentioned are, are ways in which we can serve and help others. Because I think that's why we're here. You know, most people are going through life with their hand out looking to get all of the time. They're looking to be these go-getters. And I don't really believe in go-getters. I think that's half the equation. The other half of the equation is being a go-giver, going out there and like really giving to people. That's the backbone of my business. It's like mm. giving people free content, giving podcasters my time, just being a real giver. And I keep getting all of this stuff, you mm. know, as a result of it. And so, you know, one thing that people have a hard time with when it comes to their purpose is they feel, again, that it's insignificant, and they also think that people are going to make fun of them. Mm. You know, People are going to be critical of it. People are going to say, no, you can't do that. And there's a chance that they might fail, and there's also a chance they might succeed, which is going to be a huge change in mm. their lives. And that's getting back to the brain, not liking to change. And you know, when you really think about it, like my job is silly AF. Like It is super silly. Mm. I play clips from motivational talks to people on my pack, podcast five days a week. And I teach a class every Tuesday on how to change your money mind. And then I teach health coaches how to build businesses like on a weekend every other month. Like that's my job. Mm. I read book. I read books the rest of the time. Like my job is super silly. Mm. And, you know, I'm just happy that I was able to take that leap and say, OK, despite how silly this may be, despite the fact that I'm you know, back in the day trying to create a business by teaching people health on this silly thing called YouTube, mm. um, you know, I did it and I gave and I made an impact in people's lives. And when you do that, like the universe will be like, all right, we got you. Mm. But there's a courage. There's a courage that you have to have to do that. And I just wish more people can see what's right under their noses, because just one more time, your purpose usually comes easy to you. Mm. It's that thing that people call you at 11 o'clock p.m. on a weekend they want to talk about. Or it's the mm. thing that they text you and they see that they say they need help with or the thing that you can do better than anybody, you know, like that is the gift that you were put on this earth with. And that's the thing that you need to use instead of looking forward to be higher and mightier and looking forward to be, you know, dunking a basketball or throwing a, a baseball or something like that or something that's going to make mm. you billions of dollars. You know, you can you can make a lot of money doing the easy thing, you know, that you're mm. put here, you know, with. So what's so what's yours? You were the health guy, and then what? Do you what is your? You... I have an ability to take information that I read about mm -hmm. or watch um, videos about and break it down in a way that everybody can understand. Mm. That's all. That's what underground wellness was about. That's um, how I was able to teach myself all of the things in in um, college. You know, when I was taking physiology classes or physics classes or whatever it may be, physics was actually harder than I wanted it to be. But you know, all of those things is like, okay, here's what we need to know. It's super complicated. How can I break this down in a way that not only can I understand, but my classmates can understand when you know they want me, they want my help. And so mm -hmm. I did the same thing with my personal training clients. And people were like, Sean, Sean can explain things. Like Sean can explain mm -hmm. like how you lose fat and all that stuff in a way that you can understand. And then I just took that to YouTube. And now I'm, you know, taking that to the personal development side. And mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's fun, man. It's what I like to do, whether it be in my writing or my speaking or, you know, whatever. Yeah. It got me through my university nutrition. Like there's times <laughs> where like I'd, I'd read something and not understand it. I'm like, I bet Sean's got a video on this. I'm straight <laughs> on YouTube. You know, I, I, I remember vividly about teaching me about leptin, about the brain having its ringer off. And I remember that metaphor to this day. Yeah, I would not remember anything else I've read about it for like for, for a number of years. So, yeah, so I appreciate that, that the, your gift hey. you've got with that. Um, My pleasure. So looking back now, so you've been, was it 2011 you ended the YouTube, like the Underground Wellness YouTube channel? Uh, it was somewhere around there. Yeah. Yeah, I just stopped making videos and started focusing on the podcast. Yeah. yeah. So within seven, in the last seven years, you're looking about so people trying to identify and become more go-givers and taking action. What are the biggest breakthroughs you found that have helped you do more and give more back in the last five years, whether that's meditation or whether that's, I know you like affirmations you're a fan of. So what, what, are, those, what are the biggest things you've learned in the last seven years with regards to this? Ah, biggest seven things. Um, well, meditation has been a huge, man. Mm. I put off meditation for so long. I remember Dr. Kalish and I used to talk about it when he would come on the show. He'd be like, mm. man, just sit down and meditate. And I'd be like, all right, I'm going to do it. 
one day. <laughs> and then I decided to do it. And I took a transcendental meditation class and, uh, it, it was amazing. It was like, it's totally changed my life. Mm. Not only just uh, meditation, but before I did meditation, I did uh, neurofeedback. And so okay. that helped me to kind of change some brain waves and yeah. it just really chilled me out. And so uh, meditation on top of that just took it to a whole new level. Uh, yoga has been amazing mm. as well. Like yoga, I used to be so tight all the time. And I think I had, you know, there's a lot of like bullshit that happened when I was a kid. And I feel like a lot of those emotions, those unexpressed emotions, because, you know, I lived in a family that didn't really express our emotions very much. So I kept a lot of them like inside and a lot of them were anger and going to yoga. I remember when I first started consistently going to yoga, you know, right after I turned 39 in 2016, the first month I was so angry all the time. Like I was getting results, I was getting looser, but you know, there's truth to how the body holds on to emotions. And as my hamstrings got looser and my lower back got looser and my hips got looser, I just would be so mad all the time. Mm. Like I'd be like, why am I so angry? And it was just like emotions just, just coming out of me. And sometimes like not in a very nice way, which is really interesting. Mm. And then um, a year later, like taking my meditation to another level and doing a different class, the same thing happened again. And so it's really interesting how that happens and, you know, how when that process is over, you just really start to feel lighter and you just feel better. You know, I would literally be in my therapist's office like, dude, Matt, man, I'm mad all the time. Why am I mad all the time? You know, and it's a trip. But um, so, so those things have been really huge for me. Um, Understanding how the brain works Mm. has been huge for me as well. Understanding that those negative thoughts that I talked about earlier, they're not really me. Mm. You know, it's just like, you know, they'll never go away. It's just always going to be there. That fear is never going to go away. You just got to learn to dance with it better. And I think that's, that's been huge for me. Um, I'll try to give you one more. Um, Just, just, just taking risk, Mm. you know, doing what's uncomfortable. And understanding that, yo, it's easier to do it than it is to not do it. Mm. And what I mean by that is like back in the day when I would live in fear and keep myself from taking action, I would become a very irritable person. I was very disappointed in myself all of the time. I kept living with that gnawing feeling of, mm. you know what you're supposed to do and yeah. you don't do it. You know what you're supposed to do, Sean. You know what you can do, Sean. You know what you could do, Sean. And you're not doing it because you're scared. Mm. And you keep, you know, you keep saying on Monday or January 1st or February 1st or, you know, that's when you're going to start. And that day comes and you don't do it. Mm. And that feeling is so hard for me to deal with. Mm. I would rather just do it. I'd rather just do it and land flat on my face, which never happens, but I'd rather do it and land flat on my face in front of the entire world than live with that feeling all the time. Because it's that feeling that bleeds into every part of your life. Because that feeling, as I said earlier, feeling is conscious awareness of your vibration. And your vibration is what attracts people and circumstances and events into your life. And if you're walking around with that feeling, I can guarantee that life is not going to go very well Mm. and you're not going to change because you know what you're going to do? You're going to keep running the loop of thoughts and feelings, feelings and thoughts, thoughts Mm. and feelings, feelings and thoughts. And as long as the thoughts and feelings don't change, your circumstances are never going to change because you're never going to be able to take a different action. And so I rise above the thoughts and I rise above the feelings and I create something new. And if I suck at it, I know I can get better. And I'll give you one more before I let you go or before um, before we're done here. Um, I'm not, I, 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 I guess I've always been this way, but just for your audience, you have to be willing to learn new stuff. Mm. A lot of us, we go, I don't know how to do that. And so we don't do it. Mm. You know, I'm the guy who goes, all right, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to watch all the help videos. You know what I'm saying? Mm. I'm going to sit down and I'm just going to do it anyway. And I'm sure by tomorrow I'll have a pretty good hang of it. And if I ever have to do it again, I know how to do it. Mm. And a lot of us are just unwilling, as I always say, to sit our asses down and do it. Mm. We all want to play all the time. We want to play. We want to watch TV. We want to watch YouTube. We want to be on Instagram. What we need to 